What is up, math friends? Welcome to another episode in preparation for the study of untwisted vertex operators. Today, we are going to be looking at a representation of the Vita Soda algebra, uh, a concrete representation of the Vita Soda algebra with a non trivial action of the central charge uh, using Heisenberg modules. We will be using a lot of the ingredients that we have discussed so far in recent times, and so I leave it to you to be responsible for the Heisenberg algebra associated to a finite dimensional complex vector space given by the Heisenberg functor, you know, if you like a canonical Heisenberg algebra, the canonically associated Heisenberg module given by the Stone von Neumann theorem associated to that Heisenberg algebra, and finally the Vita Soda algebra and its central term and all of that stuff that we covered last time. We will use all of that stuff with abandon. Uh, and just to prepare yourself, here is a cheat sheet of all the relevant formulae that we have used recently. So you can always refer back to this if you need it. Awesome. Get your pens, paper, pencil, chalk, whatever. <laughs> and let's get started. Our strategy today for finding the action of the Vita Soda algebra on, <laughs> on Heisenberg modules will be similar to the strategy that we employed when studying its action on Laurent polynomials. Specifically, we're going to be looking for a degree derivation acting on the basis of the associated Heisenberg module. <laughs> and then we'll generalize to study an algebra of derivations and show that that algebra of derivations, integer graded algebra, uh, basically gives us the wit algebra, which we can centrally extend as we please. Then, following a trick by FLM, we will use the canonically defined inner product on those Heisenberg modules, that is to say the unique symmetric bilinear form induced by the unique anti-linear, anti anti-involution omega, uh, the Hermitian conjugate, if you like, on the Heisenberg module. We will use that thing, that inner product, to fix and determine the nature of the action of the central element on the Heisenberg algebra, and we will find that it is representation dependent. All right, so first things first, the degree derivation of Heisenberg modules. So for everything we discussed today, let V be a finite dimensional vector space and let H be the Heisenberg algebra associated to V via the Heisenberg functor that we've discussed in the past. We'll also let M be the canonically associated Heisenberg module, uh, which is modeled by the symmetric tensor algebra over the negatively graded subspace of H. Now, let EI be an orthonormal basis for our vector space V. Then we have a basis for our Heisenberg algebra H given by EIA, where A is now that affine index that takes values in the integers. Similarly, we have a basis for M, the Heisenberg module, by all finite products of basis elements of H. Note that both H and M are Z graded. And in particular, the basis elements span subspaces of homogeneous degree uh, a. So what I mean is the degree of EIA is just given as A and the degree of say EIA times EJB is just A plus B. So a degree operator acting on H or M is something that acts on a basis element say EIA and gives us back that degree. So D on EIA would give us A times EIA. Similarly, a degree operator acting on a product from the Heisenberg module M, D acting on, say, EIA times EJB would give us back A plus B times EIA EJB. One quick remark here. Um, let D be a, some degree operator on the Heisenberg algebra H. If D also happens to be a derivation of M, then D is automatically a degree operator also on M, we immediately see that D uh, on such a product like EIA EJB is given by, again, A plus B, EIA EJB. Okay, so to construct a degree operator on H, it first helps to consider the adjoint action of one basis element upon another. So let's, let's consider the action of EIA 
acting via the adjoint on EJB. We can write out explicitly in terms of the Lie bracket. And so EIA acting on EJB just gives us delta IJ, delta A plus B comma zero times A. Note that that second Kronecker delta allows us to rewrite this instead of A in terms of B, that is to say the degree of the vector that's being acted upon. So we can write this out as minus B delta IJ delta A plus B comma zero. Based on that, we can now define a candidate degree operator D on H as follows. So let D equal minus one half the sum over the vector space indices, the sum over the integers, E J minus the absolute value of N, E J plus the absolute value of N. For right now, we can just consider this as a, as a technical definition, but the structure of this, particularly those absolute value signs you might recall are related to issues of ordering, making sure that the series is well defined by avoiding questions of conditional convergence and all that kind of stuff. So claim D is a degree operator on H. Proof, <laughs> like we will do many times a day, we proof by direct computation. <laughs> So we demand that D act by the adjoint. So let's compute the commutator of D with EIJ. By linearity of the Lie bracket, we can just pull those summation signs out, right? So we get minus one half, both sums, uh, times the commutator of EJ minus N, EJN with EIA. And again, by linearity, we can break these into two commutators. So you have another sums with two terms, Great, and so then we can use the definition of a Lie bracket to evaluate these two terms. And then to simplify just a little bit, we can perform the sum over the vector space indices. And so we're left now with a sum over the integers with two terms in the sum. And we have to specify the value of A to proceed. So there are three cases that will give us three different results. A is e either zero, <laughs> Uh, positive or, or negative. So for the case of A equal to zero, we see right away that the Kronecker delta forces the absolute value of N to also be zero, <laughs> right? So when, when we perform that sum, in other words, um, both of these terms are going to vanish because of the factor of the absolute value of N out in front. In other words, D acting on E I zero is equal to zero. Great. Okay. So now let's consider the case where A is greater than zero. So in this case, only the first of those two terms contribute because the absolute value of N could never be negative, for instance. So in particular, the absolute value of N is then for fixed at this positive value A. So then now we can perform the sum over the integers and we find that this is just minus one half times minus a times e to the i a <laughs> uh, plus another copy of e to the i a because we're summing over all the integers and both plus or minus n contribute to this sum, right? Because of that absolute value sign. Awesome. So once again, we have d with e i a is equal to a e i a for zero and positive values. So similarly, you can perform this calculation for a less than zero. In this case, we find that only the second term in the sum contributes because now the absolute value of n is restricted to minus a, which is negative. And so you can carry through the calculation precisely as with the positive case and you find that once again, d with eia is equal to a eia. So in other words, D is a degree operator on H, and so we're done. An immediate corollary of this is that D is also a degree operator on the Heisenberg module M. To see this, just observe that D acts by the adjoint, and the adjoint is nothing more than the Lie bracket, and the Lie bracket is a derivation manifestly. So therefore, by the remark earlier, we see that D is also uh, the degree operator on M, and so we're done there as well. Next up, the algebra of derivations that act uh, similar to those objects dm that acted like t to the m times d, where d is t d by dt. In order to continue to copy the strategy that we employed for the Laurent polynomials for finding the Vita Soto algebra, in this case, we need to find a new kind of derivation that acts kind of like the degree derivation on the Heisenberg algebra, but not quite. 
in the sense that it'll pull down the the degree of a basis element, but also shift that basis element by a fixed amount. In particular, we're looking for some operators DM that act on EIA as A, E, I, A plus M. Immediately we see that such an operator is going to have non-trivial homogeneous degree because if we act on DM, E, I, A with the degree operator, we should get something back that looks like M plus A times that thing. This suggests that the commutator of D, the degree operator with these DM, whatever it is, should be M DM. In other words, these operators DM should have homogeneous degree M. So a reasonable guess built from our understanding of the degree operator D might be uh, DM equal to minus one half, the sum over the vector space indices, the sum over the integers, E to the I M minus N, E I N, where now every single term in that infinite series has homogeneous degree M, right? Because the homogeneous degree of a product <laughs> of, of two basis elements is given by the sum of their degrees. So this gives us hope that such an operator, such a DM constructed this way, may well act in the desired way. So to that end, claim, <laughs> we claim that the Lie bracket of DM with EIA is given by A EI M plus A. Proof. Once again, we prove by direct computation. This computation is going to be very similar to the last claim that we just proved, in the sense that we first expand the D operator and use the linearity of the Lie bracket to pull the sums out and, and write it as minus one half, sum over the vector space indices, sum over the integers, the Lie bracket of ej m minus n, ej n with e i a. Right? And we can use the derivation property of the Lie bracket to convert this into two terms like last time. And because of the last claim that we proved, we know what these Lie brackets are, so we can just evaluate them directly. And once again, to simplify things, we can simply perform the sum over the vector space indices. And so we're left with, once again, an infinite sum over the integers with two terms and some Kronecker delta functions flying around. Now, because we don't have any absolute value signs to worry about, we can perform these sums directly. And we find, once again, both terms are equivalent to each other, canceling that factor of one half and the minus signs cancel. And so we're left with the fact that the bracket of DM with EIA is given by A E I M plus A. Awesome. So this gives us hope that we can use these DM operators to, to maybe furnish a representation, at least of the Witt algebra. But first one, one note is in order. We already discussed that the degree operator acting on such a thing DM must be M DM. That's the, the definition of a degree operator since DM clearly has homogeneous degree M. From the perspective of the Witt algebra, this is a little strange, right? Because the Witt algebra will tell us that say like D N with D M should be N minus M D M. So that in particular D zero, the degree operator with D M should be given by minus M D M. So we're off in other words, by minus sign. So to that end, we can simply realize, oh, let's just multiply through by minus signs everywhere. <laughs> in other words, define operators L sub M as minus dm. So to be as precise as possible, we're defining the operators lm as one half, the sum of the vector space indices, the sum over the integers, the normally ordered product of the two factors eim minus n, ein. And of course that normal order, that normal ordering doesn't really matter unless m is equal to zero, but suffice it to say, we're gonna leave it there. So claim these lm operators furnish a representation of the Witt algebra. In other words, their Lie bracket of LM with LN is given by M minus N, LM plus N. Proof. Well, we already know uh, half of this business, right? We already know that from the last claim that we proved that LM with EIA is given by minus DM with EIA, which is just minus A EIM plus A. Cool. So we will use this in the computation that follows. To begin with, let's assume that both M and N are non-vanishing, right? So that um, we'll deal with the case where one of them is vanishing at the end. The case where both of them vanishes is trivial by the definition of a Lie bracket, right? So um, let's, let's, let's begin there. So to perform this computation, it's quite similar to usual. We'll start with LM and LN, and we'll expand the LN operator, 
as per usual, and then using the properties of the Lie bracket, the linearity and the derivation properties, this gives us, as per usual, two terms. And once again, we know what these two terms evaluate to in terms of commutators. And so we have the sum over the vector space indices, the sum over the integers, um, two terms that have normally ordered products of uh, basis elements of the Heisenberg algebra. Now, the second term can be brought to look similar to the first term if we perform a shift, and that shift takes L to L minus M. So if we do that and collect like terms, what do we end up with? One half, the sum of the vector space indices, the sum over the integers, M minus N times E to the I M plus N minus L, E I L. In other words, M minus N L M plus N. So for at least the case where M and N are both non-zero, uh, the Witt algebra conditions are satisfied. Awesome. For the case where n is equal to zero now, things the calculation is a little bit different. So you can perform the calculation all the way through up to the point where you're about to shift the index in the second term because, frankly, you can't. That normal ordering condition imposes these uh, absolute value symbols on the summation index. However, <laughs> do not despair. What we're going to do instead is simply expand both of those terms um, into two series. So we're going to sum over the positive values of the index and the negative values of the index separately in both terms. The, the zeroth value in both terms is proportional to the number zero, right? So it doesn't matter. Um, and so as you can see, what we'll do is we'll simply take the first half of the first term and combine it with the second half of the second term because they look identical. They're structured identically. Similarly, we'll take the second half of the first term with the first half of the second term and, and sum them together because, again, they look identical. So now we have two series, <laughs> two infinite series, bidirectional, in other words, over, over the integers. Uh, and we've essentially eliminated that, that those absolute value signs by this clever rearrangement. And so we can perform the shift as we did previously. And once again, we are left with it that the bracket of LM with L0 is equal to MLM. Cool, right? And so we're done. Now there's one subtlety that I have not yet explained, and that is if you work out the commutator of LM with L minus M for, you know, M not equal to zero, things don't work out exactly right. The end result is no longer normally ordered. That is to say, the L zero that you think that you would find, what we normally define in terms of the normal ordering, that is to say all negatively graded terms to the left and all positively graded terms to the right, doesn't show up. Instead, we have the non normally ordered version of this. So what do we do with that? Well, we could always force it to be normally ordered. And then we are ended, then we end up with a sum, right, which is conditionally convergent, which in the parlance of the Riemann series theorem means that we can make it equal any value we want, or put differently, it could equal it could converge to any value uh, within the reals. And so oftentimes physicists will write this as <laughs> plus a constant, right? Polchinski does this, uh, Greenshorst Witten do this, a anyone discussing kind of just says that by fiat. Uh, but really what they mean is it's not just some constant that's yet to be determined. It means it can be literally any constant, but, but that doesn't help us here, right? So, so the one thing that's helpful, I suppose, is the fact that there certainly is a constant for which this equation holds, for which this statement is true. And that is the constant when it vanishes. But what about what about other values of the constant? Clearly you see the need for a central term. And this is where the central term comes into play. The point is that it's still true. The claim is still true, but it's only in some sense conditionally true. It's true if we spe specify that that constant should be zero. And that, that constant represents a sort of degree of freedom that the system has that is extremely subtle. Remember, the vita Soda algebra is isomorphic up to two free parameters, and we choose those parameters uh, as, you know, 1 over 12 and minus 1 over 12 by, by convention. But anyway, I've said too much. Let's keep going. Okay, now we can discuss the central element, C, which you might recall has the form C, F of M, or F is an odd function of M, and by convention, we choose it to be 1 over 12 m minus 1 times m times m plus 1, or, you know, m cubed minus m. The problem here is we don't know what the action of the central charge is. 
For the Heisenberg algebra, right, it also had a central element. Uh, physicists might call it H bar, but we always set its action on the associated Heisenberg module to one. In some sense, that was a choice uh, of the definition of the module itself. But for this central charge, we will find that the action of it on the Heisenberg modules under consideration is um, given to us by the inner product. So in other words, the way to compute its action is simply to take uh, the operator statement, that is the commutator of dm with d minus m, uh, which is equal to 2m d0, the Lie bracket of lm with l minus m, minus the results, that is a minus 2ml0, minus c f of m, operate completely with that, which we know is zero, on the vacuum vector v0, and take the inner product of that with the vacuum vector itself. From there, we can simply isolate the term c f of m to one side of the equation and let the rest of that inner product by linearity over to the, to the right-hand side. Since we know that the action of c is going to be a scalar for a lot of reasons, one, we've directly observed it, and two, we know from proposition 1.7.2 in FLM that any operator that commutes with every operator in the Heisenberg algebra necessarily operates by scalar multiplication, whatever, we can just pull that thing out of the inner product. Recall that the inner product of V0, the vacuum vector with itself is normalized, so we can throw that out. And what's left is c times f of m, which we've fixed by convention equals the rest of this mess. So the main, sec main calculation here will be evaluating the right-hand side of this equation. To do that, we're going to need uh, three preliminary results. Uh, first, lemma one, the action of Lm, where m is greater than zero, on the vacuum vector v0 is zero. Proof. Well, to prove this, you can show by direct computation, simply expand the operator LM, and then you can see that one of the factors is always going to have a positively graded uh, basis element of the Heisenberg algebra, so it will always annihilate the vacuum vector. Cool. Okay, lemma two. LM acting on the vacuum vector for M less than zero always presents us with a finite sum. Proof. <laughs> Okay, so for this one, it's pretty much exactly the same strategy for calculations. You just expand the operator LM, right? And then let us look to see which of these terms annihilate the vacuum vector. So anything with a positively graded EIA will annihilate, right, the vacuum vector. So clearly this is the case for all values of N that we're summing over, where N is either greater than zero or less than minus M. And so we're left with m plus 1 terms uh, uh, in our series, which is totally tractable, and we can handle. Cool. Um, a quick corollary to this second lemma uh, is that the term with L0, that is to say uh, L0 acting on the vacuum vector, is precisely one term, and we will use that term frequently. Uh, in particular, the inner product of V0 with L0 acting on V0, we will simply call phi, um, and we'll see this show up a lot in the calculation that follows. So I just wanted to write down a shorthand for it. Cool. Okay, so this brings us to lemma three, and lemma three is just a simple Lie bracket that we're going to deal with many, many times, and so I just thought I would uh, do it once and for all, and then we can just apply the results later. So in particular, the sum over two copies of the vector space index, J and K, of the Lie bracket, uh, EJA with, say, EKB and times EKC is given by A times the sum over one copy of the vector space index uh, times some Kronecker delta functions and one copy of those basis elements. Just, just like that. And and you can show this by direct computation. In fact, we just did. <laughs> awesome. Okay, good. So with those three preliminary results, we are now set up to evaluate the right-hand side uh, and figure out the effect of the central charge uh, of the Vita Soda algebra on the representation given to us from this Heisenberg module once and for all. So let, let's frame it as a claim. Claim the action of C on the Heisenberg module is given by the scalar that is just the dimension of the underlying vector space V used to form the Heisenberg algebra. That is to say, the action of C on V0, say, is just the dimension of V. <laughs> Very interesting, right? <laughs> cool. Okay, proof. So without loss of generality, we can assume that M is greater than zero because otherwise we could just flip the commutators around, <laughs> right? No big deal. Cool. Okay, so let's begin to evaluate the right-hand side uh, of our equation.
So by lemma one, the first thing we observe is that that Lie bracket of Lm with L minus M treated as a commutator only presents us with one term. That is to say, Lm times L minus M, because the uh, contraposition, if you like, uh, annihilates the vacuum. So that's helpful. Now by lemma two, <laughs> Specifically, the, cor uh, the corollary to lemma 2, we see that the second term is just representable in terms of that constant phi uh, that we've already discussed, right? Because we're seeing the action of L0 on the vacuum vector here. So very simple constant. Now, using the Hermitian property, the kind of uh, anti-linear, anti-involution <laughs> uh, that's native, uh, canonically associated with the inner product on this Heisenberg module, we can move that Lm from the first term to the other side of the inner product, right? Just using that involution, which just takes the Hermitian conjugate, if you like. So in other words, what we find is that the first term is nothing more than the inner product of whatever the vector is of L minus M acting on V0 uh, with itself. Very cool. Okay, so right now the right-hand side looks much simpler than it did in the beginning, especially when we also use from lemma 2 our knowledge of the fact that these Lm uh, vectors are, are simply really tractable finite sums with m plus 1 terms. So we will use this lemma and use the anti-involution, anti-linear, anti-involution omega like one more time to pull the remnants, if you like, of that operator L uh, minus M from the left side of the inner product to the right side of the inner product. So now what we end up with is a sum over two copies of the vector space indices J and K, two copies of the uh, internal indices L and M uh, over a finite range from you know minus M to zero uh, of four total copies of, of those Heisenberg algebra basis elements. And of course, minus the M phi uh, on, on the far end of the right-hand side. To further evaluate this expression, we're going to break the sum over n into three distinct parts. n is equal to minus m, n is equal to zero, and finally the rest of it. Let's start with the first part. The first part gives us uh, the usual sum over indices with ej0, ejm, ek, m minus l, and ekl, all acting on v0. Now, since the basis element ejm acting on v0 vanishes because m is assumed to be greater than zero we can just replace this with a commutator statement so that by lemma three we can evaluate that commutator and find a simple sum a simple expression that we've seen before and indeed the first part is nothing more than m times phi to evaluate the second part of the sum over n, that is the case where n is equal to zero, we can do the same thing. Only here we find that because ejm commutes with ej0, this is literally the same expression as the first part. So it too equals m phi. And so that finally, we're left with one expression for c and m because the, all the parts proportional to that constant term phi, that L0 term, cancel each other. And so we're left with just the sum over j, the sum over k, the sum over L, the sum over n, times the inner product of V0 with those four basis elements acting on V0. Cool. To evaluate this last sum, we first observe that the basis element Ej minus n acting on the vacuum vector will always vanish because n is always less than zero. So that we can replace this again by a commutator statement so that by lemma three, we can evaluate that commutator to find a bunch of Kronecker delta functions. Summing over k and summing over l gives us an expression, which we can then simplify. Uh, and once again, we find that the basis element ejm plus n will always annihilate the vacuum vector V0 since n is always greater than minus m. So we can once again replace it with a commutator statement. And evaluating the commutators simply we find so that we can sum over j to get, yes, the dimension of V plus some other stuff. Now to put this in a more friendly form, we can flip the sign in the summation and rewrite the expression as 
And so there we have it. The action of C times F of M is equal to one half the dimension of V plus some scalar sum over a bunch of junk. Awesome. There's only one step left to do. You can think of it as the dessert to this proof. And we need to evaluate that sum. To that end, let's have a little, you know, bonus claim. And the claim is that one sixth M cubed minus M is equal to that sum that we've been trying to evaluate. Okay, cool. So we'll prove this by induction. Our case that we're going to start with is, let's say, m equals 2, which is the first case that kind of makes sense in this context. Sure enough, 1 is equal to 1. Awesome. So now let's assume that it's the hypothesis is true and go ahead and prove the case for m plus 1. So this just amounts to plugging in <laughs> m plus 1 on both sides and doing a bunch of simplifications. Yep, and sure enough, lo and behold, we find that the statement would be true so long as the sum of all numbers from 1 to m is equal to 1 half m times m plus 1, which, of course, is a very famous result that we know to be true, which I think even Gauss figured out in second grade, <laughs> right? Or something along those lines. So anyway, um, great. We have now shown the claim to be true. So now let's plug that back into our uh, main, main result here. So we have c times f of m is equal to 1 half dim v times 1 sixth m cubed minus m. Now, by convention, we choose f to be 1 half uh, m cubed minus m. And so we find that indeed, the action of c is nothing more than the dimension of the underlying vector space v. And we're done. Awesome, right? And so there you have it. That's why our convention for the central term is c f of m, or c over 12 m cubed minus m, uh, simply because in that case, the action of the central charge, the central term C of the Vita Soto algebra on the Heisenberg module simply gives us the dimension of the underlying vector space V. Pretty cool, huh? And so that's what we mean when we say it's representation dependent. It depends on that underlying vector space V. This has important consequences, for example, in string theory, where that vector space amounts to the space in which your strings are vibrating through. That is to say, space-time. But we'll leave that discussion for, for a later date. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Next time, uh, I'm torn. I'm either going to go over twisted vertex operators briefly, just smash through them, or we will do the same calculation, but for a different representation uh, of the Vita Soda algebra. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>